thanks for the introduction and also thanks for the opportunity to talk today. I also want to ask, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, both sure. are perfect. Nice. So we're going to go from the above ground organs to the underground, like under soil organs now, basically. And we have all seen in the last years pictures like that, pictures of landscape that has been undergone severe drought, even in the UK. And so we now have to ask the question, how can we adapt our crop plants in the next years better to it? And one a bit underexploited target are the roots of the plants. Basically, because they are invisible most of the time because they are in the soil. So we don't really pay a lot of attention to them. But we have to keep in mind that they are crucial for the plant growth because they are the organs that take up water and nutrients from the soil. And because all the soil resources are not distributed equally and evenly in the soil, it's very important to look at the distribution of the roots in the soil. Because it depends on the position of the roots, which kind of um, resources they can access. For example, the topsoil roots are able to um, access immobile nutrients, such as phosphate, that has been applied as fertilizer, for example while roots that are located deeper in the soil are able to take up water and uh, deep soil nutrients from there. And what positions those roots in the different soil layers? And that's the root angle. And the root angle is um, determined by the gravitopic set point angle of the roots. And that's a bit of a difficult or bulky word. Um, so it uh, defines the angle of the organs in respect to gravity and depends on the root type, the developmental stage, and the environment. And I use barley as a, as a model plant, because first of all, barley is a crop plant, as you all know. Um, so the research that is done there can be immediately translated to agriculture and uh, breeding. But also, because cereal roots, uh, cereal root systems are a nice model for the gravitopic set point angle. If we look at young, a young barley seedling here, you can see that it has a few seminal roots, which are all of the roots that you can see here, basically, um, which are embryonic roots that arise after germination, and they have all they're all the same root type and have approximately the same age and the same developmental stage, but they all differ in the gravitopic set point angle. So they're an ideal model to compare um, the, the roots in terms only of the angle and not other um, parameters. What is important to know about the gravitopic set point angle is that roots have kind of a memory of it. So even when they are misplaced from it, they remember it and go back to it. And that's shown in classical rotation experiments where you grow your young, young seedling and rotate it 90 degrees and then follow the root growth over time. And what you can see here for roots that have, for example, a 45, roughly 45 degrees angle before the rotation, when they are, display, like, when they are rotated, they still have sorry, um, a 45 degrees, ang degrees angle afterwards. So they just continue to grow down in that 45 degrees angle. Why roots? that are a bit char a bit um, steeper and are misplaced a lot from the angle um, grow back to the angle over time. So there has to be some, some kind of mechanism um, that makes them rem remember the angle. And the response of the angle is related to gravity, as I said. And what happens in root tips um, in gravitopism is that in the root cap, we have starch-filled granules that are denser than the cytoplasm and therefore sink down in the cytoplasm and then trigger a signaling cascade that involves different players, to name a few, auxin that's basically involved in everything all the time, but also calcium and pH changes that then triggers a differential, differential cell elongation in the cell elongation zone. In this example here, the cells at the top would elongate more to then direct the root growth back downwards. Previously, we have um, identified a main um, player in root gravitopism and root angle regulation in barley um, that we called Enhanced Gravitopism 2. 
And in comparison to wild type, where we see this kind of widespread root system with wider angles, we see steeper angles only of the roots in the enhanced gravitopism 2 or EGT2 mutant. This phenotype was very stable and also held true in soil. You can see here um, uh, soil filled rhizotrons. And the wild type on the left, which has a very wide um, root system, and then on the right here, where we see the EGT2 mutant with a very steep root angle, even in other root types, um, you can see here the older crown roots as well as the lateral roots that have steeper root angles. We called um, EGT2 enhanced gravitopism 2 because we also found that um, it has an enhanced reaction to gravity. So in the rotation experiment that I've shown you before, the roots actually adapt much faster and are much stronger, again, back to their original angle. The uh, function of EGT2 is conserved between plant species, which comes on the next slide, and I, do, I wanted to spoil that. <laughs> what I wanted to say before is that we also identified um, the gene that is responsible for the phenotype. We used bulk segregant analysis and whole genome sequencing to um, find the gene or the mutation in the gene um, that causes the phenotype, and it encodes for a sterile alpha domain containing um, protein. Now, as I've already spoiled, um, we found that the function, the gene function, is very conserved. And also here in the double mutant of um, the EGT2 homologs in wheat, you can see that the root angle is much steeper than in the wild type. So we were wondering what the role of EGT2 is. So how does it actually function? And first check the expression by RNA and Z2 hybridization and found expression in the root cap, in the meristem, and in the elongation zone. So in all the zones that are related to um, gravitropism as well. We then used RNA sequencing of those exact zones, the root cap, the meristem, and the elongation zone, um, and found most strikingly that genes related to um, cell wall processes were differentially regulated in the EGT2 mutant, and that the majority of differentially expressed genes in EGT2 were also um, involved in gravitopism that we have um, looked at in a different experiment. We also looked at protein interactors by uh, used to hybrid screening and bifluorescent complementation and found some methyl transferases and heavy metal transport um, protein as, as interactors. So what do we know so far about the gravitopic set point angle? Um, we know that it's specific for specific root types, developmental stages, and environmental conditions, and that it can be maintained even if the plant or the organ is misplaced from that. It is related to gravitopism, which takes place in the root tip. And among others, the, one of the main regulators in barley and also in other plants um, is EGT2. Now, what do we still want to know? And basically, that's the project I'm working on right now in my fellowship at the um, James Hutton Institute. I want to find out how the roots actually remember the angle. Um, and my approach is to look at the transcriptomes of roots with different angle to hopefully find um, transcripts that are correlated with the respective root angle. And looking more into the future, I would also uh, compare the proteome of um, root roots with different angles. Secondly, I'm interested in how EGT2 functions in more detail because Right now, we only looked at the transcriptomics level, but we don't actually know what is the role in cell wall organization um, of EGT2. And I would also like to analyze the EGT2 protein expression pattern in more detail by creating translational reporter lines. And this knowledge, basically, I would like to know, or I would like to apply to knowledge for agriculture. So if we know more about the root angle, we can hopefully adapt it and then use it in uh, plant breeding, for example. And so far there's only, or there are only a few famous examples about how the root growth angle is affecting the growth of plants under specific conditions. And the most famous example is the deeper rooting one 
allele in rice or draw one or deeper rooting one. And the wild type or the reference allele has a very shallow root growth with a shallow angle, while the deeper rooting one, nearly isogenic line, has a very deep and deep root growth. And indeed, as we would expect under drought conditions, the one, like the um, allele with the steeper root, actually performs much better, presumably because it can reach the deeper soil layers with more water first. And these kind of studies are rare so far because it, there's not a lot of germplasm that has with different um, root angles, basically, because breeding so far has um, focused on the shoot of plants. So there's a bit much bigger collection and much more knowledge there. But with the EGT2 mutant now, we can actually have a look and it, have a direct comparison between a shallow uh, rooting um, plant and a very steep rooted um, rooted plant. And the good thing about EGT2 is also that the phenotype is not pleiotropic. So the only um, actual changes we found in regard to the phenotype is the change of the root angle. While there are a lot of mutants that are affected in the root angle, for example, related to auxin, but then you have a lot of shoot phenotypes as well. So you cannot really usefully use them to only rule out um, what the root angle contributes to the plant performance. And in my fellowship, I would like to test those two genotypes under different soil conditions, for example, uh, drying soil or nutrient deficiencies. With that, I would like to thank everyone who has participated and contributed to the EGT2 project, which were a lot of people. Um, some of my co collaborators from Marburg who helped with the cell wall analysis, my supervisors at the James Hutton, and also my funding from UKRI and EMBO. And I'm happy to answer questions. And also, if you have comments or suggestions, I'm happy if you write me an email afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gwendolyn. That was very cool. That was very um, you know, fascinating to think about how also these different roots each have different angles, um, which I didn't appreciate. So again, please put questions in the Q&A. And while that's happening, I get to ask my questions. Um, and it really does have to do with each of these seminal roots having a slightly different angle. And thinking about your EGT2, is there any chance that um, that has different expression in roots that have different set point angles. So could, you know, so that's something that that is, um, so in the absence of that, everything collapses to one. Do you think uh, like a dose dependency of that could give you different angles or you think it's a different mechanism? Yeah, so we actually don't know. That's the question that I would also like to answer with my transcriptomics because there I would sample roots with different angles. And basically if EGT2 would be one of those, we would see kind of correlated expression, expression that's correlated with the angle. Um, and collaborators of mine also make, I think, overexpression lines to see if there's any dose dependent effect. But so far, we don't know what the overexpression does. We only know what the mutant does. And that's basically like a very drastic phenotype. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another um, question is um, about the, you showed an image of the lateral roots coming off of this larger um, image. And then, so are the lateral roots of a given seminal root with a given angle, are they all related to the, the angle of the seminal root they come off of, or do they, are they independent? Um, I think from the start, if you don't disturb them, I think they're depending on both to prism, but also the kind of outgrowth angle. But they would also work the same way. So if you rotate the plant, they would then also go back to their gravitopic set point angle, which then is not correlated at all anymore from the angle of the, of the main root, basically. Okay. Um, so a question um, in the, in the Q&A is, so one question is that gravitropism is related to starch granules. Is there any difference in the scar in the the starch granules in the roots? Um, and then a comment that this is probably a direct application to field experiments. Yeah. Um, so for the EGT two mutant, we haven't found any difference in the occurrence of starch or even in the movement. So there are mutants where you can see that the starch granules move much slower, and that kind of inhibits the bending. But in our case, in EGT two, there is no difference, 
at least none that we found. So we think EGT2 kind of works a bit downstream of that. Um, so far, we also haven't found um, the differences between um, the roots with the different angles. But my theory would be that there is not really a difference because it's not the reaction to gravity that is changed. It's more kind of the dose that it reacts to. So it's not like there's no difference in the amount of starch granules and then you have a different angle afterwards. And then one more question kind of related to fields is that barley has many different um, local varieties that probably are from different kinds of soils. Um, do you see that that set point angle varies among different variety, uh, different varieties of barley? It does. Um, and can that be used in some way to get at the genetics of what might be at the set yeah. point angle? I think there might be, there's one group working on that right now. So there's actually a, like a variety, yes, but so far not really described and also not really shown if it's related to any kind of environment differences.